So I love power projects. I think students really like them. And as an educator, I love the fact that they get to build something and I get to destroy it for them. But what is typically missing in this type of project is not every time do they, they take in the math to the level that they need and they can get to where they have this tower that's really predictive of what they're trying to accomplish. And so it's typically the student that puts the most glue on it or puts the most beams on it. And what we wanted to do here at UK was develop a tower project that could be very predictive uh, of the student's math and then be able to demonstrate it. So the tower that we're going to design is going to need to hold five pounds. If you don't have access to a weight, you can always use a sack of flour. And what we're going to do is we're going to add the weight up on top, and then we're going to apply a horizontal load by just using a certain mass inside the Coke can. Here's a graphic that shows the spacing of it along with the horizontal load applied. One design consideration we need to think about right off the bat is how many layers do we want to have. And so in our nine inch structure, we can either have two, which would be four and a half and four and a half. Uh, three, which is three, three, and three, or four, which is all 2.25, 2.25, 2.25, and 2.25. We can then sit there and take our math and solve for uh, the forces on each of our members. Here's a 3D model of each of those options just to clarify even further for you. And if we wanted to mathematically model them, we're going to just look at one singular side and turn that into a free by diagram where we have a pin support down here and a roller support over here. So let's say this is the height of our tower we have our force coming down, what's going to happen is our beams are going to deflect a little bit. But by adding different layers within this, it's effective as I'm grabbing the middle, I'm locking it in. And so it takes drastically more force to be able to apply downward. The more joints that I have along it, the stronger it's going to be because effectively we're shortening the length of our material. To complete the math, it's a multi-step problem. And so to save time, I'm just going to direct you to another video that we have on our first year engineering page. Once we've completed our math, there's a couple of additional design considerations we need to make. The primary one being, what size diameter member do we want to utilize? Knowing that the larger diameter, the better it's going to be. So I have quarter inch, three eighths, and a half inch here. And quarter inch is right around the width of a pencil if you don't have dowel rods with you. To take a little of the guesswork out of which size to utilize, we've developed a testing document that shows tests that we've completed on each of those diameters of dowels with both two layers and three layers of material. And so if I know the strength that I need, I can then look at this chart and determine what size material I would need to utilize. Once you choose your material, you do need to develop a test to determine if your material is similar to the data that's provided. So for this build, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a continuous piece of material that's nine inches long on a paper, and I'm going to brace it right here in the middle at 4.5. And so I'm going to use one of my dowel rods to make it work. I'm going to use my quarter inch. And so I've got to have some material to work with right off the bat. So I'm going to know that my test sample is going to be 4.5, because again, we're just testing the height there at the halfway. And when I have the width of my material, material knowing that it is my diameter, which is the 0.25 pi, and then the number of times that I'm going to wrap this. And so I can either wrap this two times or three times, and when I do the math, I end up with 1.57 or 2.36 inches. And so I just happen to have material right here to be able to do that with. And notice I have the lines going horizontally. What that's going to do is it's going to allow me to know whether or not I'm rolling my material it, like effectively. Another benefit is that notebook paper is going to be more consistent than printer paper Once we have just about a half inch left, I'm going to put a bead of glue down. Notice it's not drastic or anything, and that's just standard Elmer's wood glue. And I'm going to hold it there in place. And it's going to take roughly a minute for it to be able to sort of set in place. And so after a little bit, I'm going to make sure that I can pull it off. And now I'm going to have a test sample. Once we have our sample, we've got to be able to confirm that it's going to support the similar amount of weight. Okay, so I'm going to add mass on top of it and wait for it to be able to break for me. Oh, and there we go. And so I know that I can set my weight by how much is currently on my thing. If you don't have our neat tester there, you are able to test without it. And so in this situation, I just have two boards that I have applied pegs to to hold our dowels in place. 
I used this spacing here because that allowed me to keep the centroids of the two shapes uh, in the same spot. You can also just use cardboard and I would space them out very similarly to this and just glue directly to the top and the bottom of the cardboard and get a similar test out of it. Another creative method was this. So we had a student take their dowel rods and just sort of tape at the top and the bottom and then use a Tupperware top to sort of hold those in place. I might add another little band here at the bottom and then they just used water to sort of determine the weight that was in their bowl here. Not only is it just the true mathematical value of the strength of our member in relationship to what we're getting out of our testing, but we also need to consider out our factor of safety. So in other words, when we're testing this, what level of variance do we want there to be accounted for in the strength of our material so it doesn't just collapse? Because if I build this to hold exactly five pounds, if my hands and my thumbs are on top of it while we're testing it, it's going to break. And so we've got to add some level of confidence in that or factor of safety to be able to strengthen our design a little bit and the economical value. Just for reference, here's how you calculate your factor of safety. You take your mathematical calculated force uh, of your member and then take the member that you're going to place in there, its strength, and divide it by its factor of safety, and that's going to have to be greater than its internal force. For reference, that is your internal force times your factor of safety should be your member strength. Another step that we can take is to determine the confidence that we have in the beams that we're developing. In other words, is the beam that we made just now really strong or really weak in comparison to other beams? To do that, we're going to make many samples and then to find our average and our standard deviation, and that's going to allow us to calculate our z-score. And that z-score is going to give us a confidence level. To this is another topic that's more complex, and so we have other videos to reference for it. With that, we can now start building our tower. We're going to make continuous 9 inch pieces for our sides, use the same thickness of material for our cross members, and develop cross braces out of quarter inch material. Then we also are going to apply gussets out of one and a half by half inch pieces of paper. And we're going to assemble it one side at a time. Once we have two of those sides, we're going to stand two up and build our bottom and our top, gluing those in place so that way we can get our full structure that we're then going to be able to glue to a piece of cardboard at the bottom and add a couple holes here so we can add our horizontal load. If we're successful, we can put that into our construction calculator and determine if our design was more efficient than the individuals that we might be competing against for the best design. We're going to add in our time of production. Um, in my situation, it took me about a little bit over two hours to get mine developed not counting glue trime. I'm then going to put in prices for my beams, my columns, my gussets, and my braces, and I'm going to use the calculated values down here at the bottom. And I realize that all these values are much larger than the cost of paper, but I didn't want to devalue your time, so we increased the value of the paper products. That There are a couple penalties for the wrong type of glue or being able to use too much glue, and it's going to give us a cost that we can use for how effectively you completed this project. Oh, don't break, don't break, don't break. We got this. Good luck and have fun with it.